Amen, amen, amen. Thanks, Howard, for leading us. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Doesn't it feel good in here? Who's cold right now? It feels good, huh? It's 140 degrees outside. You guys didn't know that, did you? Good to be back. Good to see you again, church. Happy Sunday. Good to be with you. Thank you for allowing my family and I a chance to get away and have some R&R, and it was, it was good. It was refreshing. We're glad to be back. So grateful for a community of believers who step up, help serve, and when you're able to go away and you know things are in good hands, that, that's an awesome place to be, and I'm so grateful for everyone, the band and the le leadership, and Greg, uh, you guys enjoy Greg Tonkinson, and I've known Greg for a long time, even back to the crusade days that he shared about, and so I was able to listen to the message, and I was encouraged by it, so awesome, awesome, awesome. Good to be back. Luke 19, we're going to pick up right where we left off two weeks ago. So turn your Bibles there. Interesting scene with Jesus walking into the temple and just getting angry and throwing tables over. So we got, we're going to get a little different picture of Jesus this morning, which is important because sometimes we can, uh, we can make Jesus out to be a little milk toast. You know what I'm saying? We can make him out to be a little bit light. You know, some of us like Jesus with the man bun driving the convertible and saying nothing offensive. That's like our picture of Jesus. But sometimes to see Jesus in a different way. And, and, and thinking about Jesus in this way, I'm going to give you a phrase, and I, I want to kind of tease it out a little bit as we talk this morning. Meekness is not weakness. Okay? So that, that's what some of you are like, got my new idea for a tattoo. Meekness is not weakness. Wouldn't that be cool? Can you imagine me all ripped? Like, meekness is not weakness. Don't picture it. It's not going to happen. But okay. I think about this, and I think about, like, you know, Howard's telling us about, think about some uh, fathers, male figures in our lives, and for me, um, when I was first saved, when I was 15, uh, I had a pastor who just, just became a great friend. His name's Pastor Ken. One day you'll meet Pastor Ken. Pastor Ken's a great guy. So here I was, punk 15-year-old, now a Christian, now a follower of Jesus, and uh, I, I love Ken. We developed a Paul Timothy type relationship. He was a mentor, godly man, spoken to my life, especially when I didn't necessarily have a household that was Christian and didn't know necessarily how to kind of shape and groom. So he became like a father to me. And one thing I knew about Ken is that he was such a kind and gracious and, and gentle soul. And so much so, like I would spearhead the group to go to Ken's house uninvited and just have game night at his house. And he'd just open his door and all the youth kids would walk in. And he was that kind of guy, right? And yet, the more I got to know Ken, there were times I took his grace and his kindness for granted. On one such occasion, we're in Mexico, Ensenada, Mexico. So we're building a camp for the nationals down there so they can have a retreat center. And I took the relationship with Ken to that next level, and I saw something Ken I'd never seen before. Meekness is not weakness. Remember that. So I said something publicly to Ken that was, that was kind of shaming. It was rude. It was disrespectful. And you know what Ken did at that moment, something I've never seen Ken do before? He laid into me. He laid into me, and trust me, I deserved it. Some of you were like, no surprise, right? 51 years old, old, nothing changes, right? He lays into me because I had said something about him to him in front of others. And Ken publicly rebuked me. In front of my youth group, he said, Scott, get up here right now. And he laid into me and I just sat there like, this is a part of Ken I've never experienced before. Meekness is not weakness. And I saw a side of Ken, and it was right for him to do that. I'm going to call it righteous indignation. And afterwards, our relationship became stronger. He taught me something that, you know what, there's, there comes a point in our relationship sometimes where, and especially with God, we can take things too comfortable, too casual, and we can cross ba boundaries that are not, you're not supposed to cross. I saw this in another pastor, not directed towards me, even though there's other stories to share. We don't have all day. Another pastor I was working with, he was preaching a sermon one Sunday at this church that I was serving in as the college pastor. And two guys walked in and these two guys were from a local cult group. And they came into the church and they started sowing seeds of division and disunity. And Greg, as soon as he was done with that sermon, grabbed these guys and they walked outside. And here it is after church. Baptist church, you're thinking potluck. This wasn't potluck Sunday. This was lay into these guys. Outside the church, Greg was yelling at these guys, get out of here, you have to... And everyone at the church was like, 
Greg, gracious, kind, gentle person, but the moment you cross a certain boundary, guess what? Meekness is not weakness. He had a flock to protect. And so those are a couple examples I think of like, is there a place where we are called to maybe get upset and get, and get, and get angry. We will call it righteous indignation, right? The Bible says, you know, be angry, but do not sin. And yet we see Jesus himself, probably one of the most uncharacteristic moments, a place that people have always wrestled with in the gospels, Luke chapter 19, where we're going to be today, where Jesus walks into the temple and he starts th throwing tables over. I can, all I think of is violence. There's a moment when the son of God, the king of kings is violent and he is just in being violent because he doesn't want you to forget meekness is not weakness. So turn to Luke 19, very familiar account. We are uh, at Monday of the Passion Week. So two weeks ago, we were at Sunday. What happened Sunday? Triumphal entry. Jesus mounts the, the colt, the foal, as he, as he rides the back of this, this young, uh, young donkey into the city. This is his way of entering as king. The people are singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. He's not entering in a manner that the people are anticipating, right? Because he's not going to overturn the Roman government. He's not going to come in as a military conqueror. He's coming in to die upon a cross for the sins of people. Because though we want Jesus to conquer the world, first he has to conquer our hearts. Amen. Before Jesus does anything outside of us, he needs to do something within us. This is the mission of Jesus, to seek and save those who are lost. I'm the chief of the sinners. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus came. The next day, Monday, the tone changes. He doesn't ride peacefully into the city on a colt. He comes into the temple. Look at Luke chapter 19, if you would. And, and we're going to see Jesus like we've never seen Jesus before. And that's good. We need to see this full or picture of Christ. We need to see his righteous indignation on display. What are the things he's upset about? What are the things he's angry about? These are going to prove to be the points of our message this morning as we, uh, as we unpack Luke. Luke is not the only gospel writer that includes this scene. Matthew includes it. Uh, Mark includes it. And John includes it. But John includes us the first time he does it, because in John 2, Jesus does it at the beginning of his ministry. So he actually cleanses the temple twice, which is pretty awesome, right? So this is just not a one-off deal. But, Mar but Luke includes it, and he wants you to understand that Jesus comes into the city, and uh, it's already buzzing, right? And just like, you know, a beehive buzzing, now he's going to poke the beehive with a stick. Anyone out there like poking beehives with a stick? I'm that kind of guy. If there's a fire, I'm pouring more gas on it, right? If there's a rattlesnake, I'm throwing rocks out of it and taunting it, right? I'm just kind of that person. So the city's already a buzz. He's going to stoke the beehive and get this thing stirred up even more. So here he is, and he's going to come in. And, and what's the general idea of why he's upset? Because the people have failed to live up to their mandate of God's, as God's people. They have failed in understanding their mission. This is why he's upset. And so we look at Luke chapter 19, look at verse 45. He enters the temple. He begins to cast out those who are there selling. So notice the temple is a place of worship, but notice what they're doing in the temple. They're not worshiping, they're selling. He enters the temple, begins to drive out those who sold, saying to them, don't you know it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer? Mark includes for all the nations. Luke leaves that out, but Luke assumes it because he's saying Jesus is for everybody. Don't you know that my house, my temple is a house of prayer for all the nations? And he says, but you have made it a robber's den. And as he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes were, and leading men among the people were trying to destroy him, verse 48, and they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging upon his words. So may God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So here's Monday, Passion Week. What happens? Well, all the gospel writers tell us he goes to the temple to clear out the temple. But Matthew says this isn't the first thing that happens on Monday. Something else happens on Monday leading up to the temple cleansing. And you're asking me, what is it? I'm glad you asked. Matthew 21. Turn there in your Bibles. So here's, I want to give you this full perspective because this is why having four gospel accounts of the life of Christ is so important. 
right? You would think the only thing Jesus did on this Monday of Passion Week was cleanse the temple. Something happens before that already shows us a little bit of the spiciness of the Savior, right? So can our Savior be spicy? Is your Savior big enough to be a little bit spicy? I hope so. Because he's spending the night at his besties house. Remember who Jesus' besties are? Mar Martha, Mary, and... Lazarus, right? And you can imagine they're up playing Clue, they're up playing Checkers, they're up playing, you know, Nintendo. I don't know what they're doing, but they're drinking beer, playing board games, right? But all of a sudden, I think Jesus wakes up extra early that morning and says to the disciples, all right, guys, time to go. And they're like, wait, we want to sleep in. We haven't had our cereal yet. Jesus says, we got a job to do today. And maybe there's a little extra spice, there's a little extra pep in his step, but Jesus says, let's go. It's time to get busy. And I think the disciples sense a different kind of spirit in Jesus on this day. Because look what happens in Matthew before they even get to the temple. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. So number one, I can identify with this. I wake up every morning hungry. Matter of fact, there's not a day, part in the day that I'm not hungry. Can I get an amen from somebody? So I got the spiritual gift of eating. So he becomes hungry and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it, but only leaves. So now he's angry. What do you get when you get hungry and angry? Hangry. You never knew Jesus got hangry, did you? Well, here it is. But his hunger, and I want you to understand this, isn't a physical hunger. Jesus said his food and his drink was to do the will of the Father in him. There's a spiritual event that's about ready to happen. He goes to the fig tree, and I'm going to tell you right now, I love figs. Anyone else like figs? Figs and dates. Oh, so good. So the more you eat figs, the more you become like Jesus. Someone told me that, so that's why I eat a lot of them. So he went to it, found nothing on it, and he says to the fig tree, don't try this in your garden. I tried to do it to a tangelo tree. It doesn't work. You can't speak to the tree. Say to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. Fig tree withered at once. This is unique because Jesus performs a miracle, but it's a reverse miracle. His miracle is always restored. Here's an example of his miracle destroying. Why would Jesus do this? When the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. First point in your notes, and I want to tease this out because this is important. Even though it's not in Luke, this is an important point leading up to the temple cleansing. And it's this. Jesus is exposing a lack of purpose and mission. What do, how do we connect Matthew 21 with this point? I'm, I'm trying to tease out. So here he is. He's on his way to the temple. He's with the disciples. And with Jeremiah-like fashion, with a prophet-like like passion, he approaches a tree, a fig tree, and curses it because it hasn't borne fruit. What are we to make of this? The fig tree, according to scripture, and this is an important piece to understand, symbolizes Israel. See, what Jesus is doing, he's giving them an appetizer before the main entree is served. On their way to the temple, he sees a fig tree. Everyone in that time understood the fig tree was a biblical allusion to Israel. And when he looks at the fig tree and finds no fruit on it, he is basically condemning Israel who have borne fruit as fruitless, thus condemning them in their purposelessness. So the disciples are already going, man, Jesus is spicy. What's going to happen next? Like this is the first thing that's happening this day. Monday, how many of us wake up on Monday and it's kind of a blaze? Right? Don't we typically think of Mondays as the blahs? If the cure sings a song about Mondays being so blah, it's got to be blah. Can I get an amen from somebody? God bless you. So this is no blah Monday. This is a Monday in which Jesus on the way curses a fig tree. And the disciples are like, why would he do this? And Jesus is saying to them, because that fig tree is symbolic of Israel. 
and you're about ready to see a condemnation of God's people that needs to happen. Because if you go back to the verse, Paul, if you real, real, real quick, notice what he says. He says, you're going to not only be able to do what has been done to the faith, but even if you say to this mountain, don't miss this. It's not any mountain. He's not saying go to Piesta, we peak and do it. Go to Camelback Mountain, do it. He says this mountain. Why, what is this mountain? This mountain is the mountain which the temple is built upon. And what Jesus is telling the disciples is, I'm going to tell this mountain to be lifted up and cast into the sea. I'm about ready to go up to the mountain and to the center of Jewish worship and destroy it. Can you imagine the disciples going, ooh, this is going to be a fun day. But it starts with God's mission for the people of Israel from the very beginning. You are to be a light to the nations. You are to give hope to the people around you. You are to be people who not only honor me with your lips, but to honor me with your hearts. And the moment you don't understand God's purpose for your life, his purpose for your life, is the moment you live dissatisfying existences. Let me say it another way. We're so often taught, follow your dream. Find your purpose. Discover your purpose. I tell you right now, all those roads lead to dead ends. Because you were never designed and you were never put here to find your dream. You were here to find God and follow his dreams. You were never put here to discover your purpose. You were put here to discover God and find out his purposes. If you have been blessed by God, you are now to be a blessing for God. Okay. Too many men and women disregard what God wants in lieu of what they want. And they continue to come up short time and time again. Why? Because unless you're living according to the will of your creator and maker and author and, and, and savior of your soul, you'll never find fulfillment unless you're doing what he wants you to do. See, Israel had a purpose and they rejected that purpose to do what they wanted to do. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, when you understand God's purpose for your life to not only be blessed by God, to be a, but to be a blessing for God to others, until you get to that place, you're going to come up short. You're going to be fruitless. You're going to be purposeless. You're going to be passionless because you'll never understand that the greatest joy in your life is to serve the will of him who has saved you. Boy, how many of us need that reminder? I mean, there's a local college and their, their, their board, billboards say, discover your purpose. Now, I'm not speaking against that, that school. They, they do a lot of good things, but I'm going, it just feeds a mentality that's divorced of God's purpose. You realize that the only purpose that's going to live for eternity is God's purposes. I don't want to leave you guys short of that. I don't want to sell you short of that. See, if you don't understand every waking moment, you have an opportunity to live out God's purpose in your life. You've been blessed. Now be a blessing. Missio Dei, the name of the church. God says, as the Father has sent me, now I send you go and love people. Boy, this was put on international display yesterday. Soccer. Who watches soccer? That's what I thought. No one in this room, right? Oh, okay. So, Euro 2020. Euro 2020. Yesterday, there's a, there's a game between Finland and Denmark. 43rd minute of the game, a player from Denmark goes down. Collapses. And all of a sudden, the game stops, right? Usually, when a player falls on the ground, they're putting on the greatest acting demonstration you've ever seen in your life. The greatest actors in the world are soccer players. Come on. Who would agree with that? Oh, yeah. Someone gets scraped. They're like, ah! <laughs> right? Yeah, basketball, LeBron James. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. But, but here's the thing. This player, fall, he collapses to the ground, 43rd minute of the game. His name is Christian Erickson. And all of a sudden, the game stops because the players realize this, this, this guy's not faking it. And for an hour and a half, the game is suspended because everyone, not only on the field, but in the, arena, in the stadium is concerned about this one player. 
You, you don't see this in soccer. As a matter of fact, this is the talk of the sports world this weekend. How the teams, how the fans responded to a player down. And you know what instantaneously happened? The, the, the t- players from Finland got together in a circle and started praying. What happened with Denmark? All those players got together with their coaches and started praying. And they even came together and they were even around Christian Eriksson. And they were just making sure he was okay. Because why? The purpose at that moment was not to win a soccer game. The purpose at that moment was to make sure that young man was okay. Is that not awesome? So much so, the fans, you know what happened in the game? The people from Christian fans from Finland started chanting, Ericsson. And all of a sudden, in a song, back and forth, Christian Ericsson. Are you kidding me? If you know anything about soccer fans, they're like gangs. Crips, Bloods, they're all over. England, they're all over. Europe, they're all over. I mean, these are some hardcore, nothing mattered about your loyalty to what team you were rooting for. What mattered was the the health and and well-being of this player. Isn't that awesome? And this is what the sports world is talking about today. How, at that moment, humanity won. How, at that moment, Dignity won. You are more than just a soccer player at that moment. You are more than just a world-renowned sports figure at that moment. You're a human being. And how we need to be reminded of that, you guys, when, when you and I are we're so prone to go about our, our daily business and our daily routines and to treat people as, oh, that's my mailman, that's my coworker, that's my pastor, right? We're so much more than that. And oftentimes we have people in our lives that need to be thought of outside of the categories you know them in as whatever, however they serve you or however you serve them. We need to remember every single person that comes into our, 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 our sphere of existence is a person that now becomes the object of God's love. They're a human being in desperate need to find God. And I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to be a pastor to, to embrace that ideology. My role as a pastor is to help us constantly be aware that no matter where you may be, where you may go, you always have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with all people. Because the moment you lose that purpose is the moment you are purposeless, which then leads to dissatisfaction. You want to know why you're dissatisfied? You're not telling people about Jesus. Can you get an amen? Amen. I'm in Cancun, and you would think, so last week, I'm not going to brag about this. I'm not going to, I mean, I got the glow. Okay, thank you. Uh, I got the Cancun. You're thinking, what does Pastor Scott do on vacation? Guess what I do on vacation? Tell people about Jesus. It happened. I met a tour guide named Jesus. Imagine that. I'm talking to Jesus in Cancun. <laughs> Let me just tell you, there's a lot of Jesus down there. So there's this one Jesus that I'm talking to. And on the beaches of Tulum, Mexico, if you've ever been to Tulum, Mexico, softest sand you'll, you'll find anywhere. Tastes delicious. Too. I won't, but that's another story for another time. Jesus and I are talking in Tulum. And he's sharing with me about a Catholic upbringing he had and how recently Mormons had come down. And because they're trying to build up their, their story of how Jesus was in the Americas. And, but all I did for one hour with some cervezas, stale tortilla chips, and really spicy salsa, I'm telling Jesus about Jesus. That's an interesting phrase, telling Jesus about Jesus. And you know what? He was locked in. Why? Because he had never heard that God loves you as you are, where you are, and you, you don't have to bring anything to the table. He does it all. Catholic upbringing, you're not taught that. The Mormons bringing in this, this workspace salvation. And so Jesus and I were just engaged. My youngest son was right there, and for an hour plus did not say a single thing. He was engaged. Why? Because he was seeing his dad do what, I hope not just what pastors do, right? Like, I think my kids are like, well, you're the pastor. That's why you do it. No, you do that because you're a human being who's been touched by the love of God yourself. But my youngest son didn't say a single word as he's sweating in 80% humidity on the beaches of Tulum, watching his dad share Jesus with somebody. Why? Because I want him to do the same when he's older. Jesus and I exchange emails. Now we're friends via email, and I get to continue to share the gospel with him. 
But do you know what my mentality is? It doesn't matter if I'm on vacation. If there's an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, I'm going to take advantage of it. If there's an opportunity here at the coffee shop to tell someone about Jesus, I'm going to take advantage of it. Just the other day, even my baristas, I had two, there were three of us on this, we were totally like on this one guy talking about Jesus loving. So I say this, it wasn't like that. But he's sitting there at the bar and you know what? We're talking about Jesus, how he's spiritual but doesn't really believe in God. And my baristas were carrying on that spirit of saying, let, let me tell you about God. My baristas get it. I, wa I want to know that my church gets it. I want to know that you need to realize that as you go into your work tomorrow, you're there to do a job, but you also need to remember you're there to represent Jesus. And you may have an opportunity to talk to someone. You may have an opportunity to talk to your neighbor or coworker. None of us are off the hook in sharing Christ with people because that is your purpose. As the Father has sent Jesus, now Jesus turns to his disciples and says, now I send you. And all God's people said, we could go home now, huh? We're not going to. Point number two. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because Jesus is going to expose now a lack to pursue love with people. Here's the trick question. Who does God call us to love in this world? And the answer is everyone. But I'm going to tell you right now, Christians have a horrible track record with this. Can I get an amen? Amen. We're truly selective, right? And, and probably we're the, most, we're the most prejudicial of all people. And we ought not to be, right? God loves the world. He sent his son to, to show the world how much. And if, boy, if he could love me, he can love anybody. So we turn now to, back to Luke. So we were already in Matthew. So go back to Luke. Look at this. So now, so he cursed the fig tree. He's showing Israel its lack of, of understanding mission and purpose and not living up to God's mission and purpose. Now he goes to the heart of their spiritual center, right? The, 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 their, their, their religious practice is the temple. Now you need to understand a few things about the temple. And there are a couple things I didn't unpack first service that I'm going to unpack with you so you guys maybe are extra blessed because of this. So he goes to the temple and the temple is huge. You walk into the, the, the gates of the temple and you first encounter what we call the court of the Gentiles. This is where anyone who is non-Jew was allowed to go to worship God. 35 acres. That's how big this area is. So Jesus walks in to the 35 acres that you first encounter called the court of the Gentiles. And it is like a super Walmart on steroids. Look at verse 45. He enters the temple and he began to cast out all those who were selling. It is a giant flea market. It's a giant just estimated 300,000 sacrificial lambs because it's Passover. This is when everyone from around the, 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 the region is coming to, to celebrate Passover. So Jesus walks in and the place that was supposed to be about reverence is now about commerce. He walks in to the area that has been designated for non-Jews to meet God and there's nothing but ruckus. There's no place for someone to have a moment of reverence and worship. It's been turned into a circus. And then Jesus says, don't you know that it's written, my house shall be a house of prayer, and Mark adds this, for all the nations. You need to know that Jesus just doesn't love the U.S. of A. Can I get an Amen. Jesus even loves people from France, believe it or not. Jesus even loves people from Kenya. Jesus even loves people from North Korea. Afghanistan, can you believe it? Jesus is for all nations. But it becomes problematic when we as God's people hinder and don't help people from knowing God. And why he overturns tables, right? He walks into an environment that is less worship and more e economy and commerce, and he starts turning tables over. Matter of fact, all the other gospel writers, Matthew and Mark and John, tell us that even as people were trying to walk out, he's swatting things like out of their hands. This is like Jesus mad, right? But he's mad with a righteous indignation. Why? Because he wants people to know that all people have an opportunity to get to know God and they're preventing people from knowing God. 
They're being exposed with a lack of pursuing. They are treating people as commodities and they're not treating people as opportunities to, for them to know Jesus. That's why he quotes Isaiah chapter 56. Because in your Bibles, if you notice, right, he, 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 it's, it, the, the writing, the, the typeset's different, right? Because he quotes Isaiah chapter 56, and this is something that we need to understand and, 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 and realize that Jesus is for everybody, hence the name of our series for, for Luke, that Jesus is going to challenge us on who we choose to love and who we choose to, to, to be kind to and who we choose to show grace to. And the gospel has always been a gospel for the world. Jesus has always been a savior for everybody. And this was mentioned in the Old Testament when Israel, again, not living up to its mission, chooses not to be a light for the surrounding nations, chooses not to be hope for the surrounding you know, countries. Goes back to Isaiah. So he quotes Isaiah 56. And what I love about Isaiah 56 is that this is God's heartbeat for the world. Notice what it says. Let not the foreigner... Right? The one who is outside of Israel. Let not the foreigner uh, who has joined himself to the Lord, which is what we want, right? We want to celebrate this. We want people to join themselves to the Lord. The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs to ke who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. Think about that phrase. I used to think the pinnacle of, of, me, of God loving me is that now I'm his son or daughter, and God says, I give you even a better name than that. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, Right? There's a mission there. God's saying, I want to bring them to my holy mountain. I'm going to make them joyful in my house of prayer. Continues, for their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. The idea is it gets more intimate, more intimate, more intimate. For my house, house of prayer for all peoples. So Jesus declares in the court of Gentiles for everyone to hear, you are have prevented people from knowing God. You haven't treated them as objects of love. You've treated them as an opportunity to line your pockets. Because we're going to talk about that here in a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, we often think, and unfortunately to our, to our shame, we automatically prevent people from knowing God, right? How could people love that person, did you see their tattoos? I actually had someone say this today. Did you see their tattoo? Like this, and I said, aren't they glad, aren't they glad they're here? This person had this mentality of, oh, you can't go to church with a tattoo like that. And I'm going, yeah, you can go to church with a tattoo like that. Right? Don't we become selective? I'm glad Mike Sturber's standing at the door right now, even though he looks like an amazing security guard, right? Mike is not there to keep riffraff out. Mike is there to encourage the misfits to come in. As a matter of fact, the mentality should be this. When Jesus comes to church, does he see us loving people, even the foreigners and the, those people that are way off who may worship other gods different than you? Are they welcome here? Or are you finding ways to keep them out? Because I know there, we live in a culture where there's people who automatically know that they're never welcome in the church. Why? Because they've been told by some Christian why they're not welcome. And all I know is we need to change the narrative. We need to change the narrative and say, doggone it, if God welcomes me, he'll welcome you for sure. Because I'm the chief of sinners. No one's going to rustle that title from my hands. Because I know how wayward I was. I know how wicked I was. And I still know how wayward wicked I am sometimes still. But here's the news. This is to be a place of worship for all people. These people left no room for Gentiles to love God. They had taken up every space where the Gentiles were welcome to sell their lambs and their pigeons and their Slurpees or whatever they were selling there 
right? No option. Here's my question to you, church. Are you leaving room in your life to love people different than you? Are you leaving room in your life to talk to people about, about the thing that ultimately matters, and that's hope in Christ? Because if you're not leaving room to interact with the foreigners and the eunuchs and the people that are distant from God, your life is too busy doing things that are far from the purpose of God. So here's what I'm telling you to do. Hang out with sinners. Hang out with tax collectors. Hang out with prostitutes. Hang out with thieves. Hang out with murderers. What did you do last night? Hang out with a murderer? Ah! The church does a horrible job of telling you people to avoid. Jesus tells you all about the people you need to engage. And oftentimes at the same time, who are you going to listen to? So Jesus says, stop depriving people a place to sit and know and love God. And not only that, stop victimizing people. Which brings us to our second point. He's going to expose a lack of purity in worship. He's going to expose a lack of purity in worship. Right? Because for us, sometimes we get into, you ever heard that phrase, put on your Sunday best? Get rid of that, please. Don't ever say that. You know what you need to do? You need to put on your Sunday least. You know what I mean by that? Love the least. We are all about appearances. Put up the Sunday best, right? Let me just tell you right now, this is not about putting on your Sunday best. This is about being the Sunday least, meaning you're going to be transparent. You're going to be vulnerable. You're going to love the people that are hard to love, the misfits, the losers, the loners, the outcasts, the rejects, you know, all those people just like us. Why? Because we become too professional in our worship that we lose the purity that God wants us to have in it. Can I, can I tell you something? So I'm going to pull, I didn't do this first service and I don't know why. This is golden right here. So I'm pulling up a, a text message conversation. You, you can't see the name of the person. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who it is, even though I'm married to her. I mean, no, I'm not married to her, but, uh, but so he, why text message is important because it gets to the heart of this point right here. So uh, number one, don't ever get into an argument or debate via text messaging. It's not a good rule. Email, not a good rule. Facebook, not a good rule. Face-to-face, -face, best rule. Amen? But I sent out, so just after the elections, you guys remember that? Does it sound like eternity ago? Feel like, are you still hurt from that? Yeah, we'll get over it. Okay, so um, he's your president. Don't be like, he's not my president. Shut up. He is your president. Pray for him. Okay? He's not my president. Whatever, right? So, uh, so after the elections, uh, after the inauguration of Joe Biden, who is your president, if you're a United States citizen, he is your president. You, you may not respect the person, but you have to respect the position. Amen. Pray for it. So I sent out a message via text message. Some of you got it. If you didn't, you need to text me your digits so you can get on my text message um, announcements. But I wanted to keep, I, I've done the best I could as being a, a, a pastor during, boy, um, um, the presidential elections, coronavirus, uh, Floyd, what's going on in Minnesota, right? Racism. How does a pastor do to navigate as a church? Well, I tell you what, you don't fall to one extreme or the other. If you guys know me, I'm not an extreme guy. There's 10% over here that are wackos. There's 10% over here that are wackos. I like the 80% soft in the middle. So I send out a message to the church. Hi, Missio. Wherever you stand politically, these days are great to be alive. I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, God is still working and Christ is still saving. Amen. I call upon followers of Jesus to read and meditate Titus 3, Romans 13, right? Submit to government. Whether you agree with it or not, you're still called to submit to it. The only debt you owe to people is to love everyone and share Jesus. I'm praying for you, church. That's all I said. So this person messages me back and says, what do we do when authorities are not servants of God? I said, we still submit to them because we, they've been placed there by God, according to Romans 13. But we don't submit when we're specifically asked to do some con something contrary to God's word. We call that civil disobedience. This person says, these people hate God and we should submit? Doesn't reconcile. I said, it's tough, isn't it? I'm reminded of 1 Peter chapter 2 and even the book of Daniel. He lived in a God-hating environment and still submitted and thrived in a pagan nation. And then here's what this person says. Jesus flipping over tables is more my style. Oh, and I go, he's not ready for about what I'm ready to say. You know what I said? 
He flipped religious tables, not political ones. Smiley face emoji. <laughs> he said, LOL, I'm talking tougher than I really am. Thank you for the wise counsel. Here's what I want to say. Again, this is second service exclusive material right here. Judgment always begins in the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 4. Judgment always begins in the house of God. If the nation is not well, the church isn't doing well. That's the root. You have problems with the government? It starts here. It starts here. We have turned from worshiping God in purity to embracing all sorts of little fads and little tricks and little practices. And there's some churches you would think you're walking into a show from Main Street Disneyland and not the holy sacred temple place of God right? It's all about big screens, laser beams, and tight jeans, right? I'm going to tell you right now, the, the people that are desperate for God who are far from Jesus, when they walk into a church, they're not looking for laser beams, tight jeans, and big screens, or fog machines, or anything in between. I can keep going if you want me. No, I'm not going to. You know what? Are coming in, they're not looking for you to look like the world, they're looking for you to be different from the world because that's what the gospel creates a counter cultural community. You know what people are looking for from you? Not that you can argue every philosophical question they have about the existence or non existence of God, they're looking for you to be an authentic, transparent, and vulnerable person who says, All I know is I was once blind, but now I see, I was once lost, but now I'm found. The conversations I have at Sozo with people have, have nothing to do with any sort of college level, seminary level, doctorate level type education. They have to do with how I've trusted God through thick and thin. How I've been faithful and how I've been faithless at times in my relationships with my wife or my kids or whatever. You know what the world's looking for is for people to be real and to be honest. that is not happening in the church, why in the heck do we expect it anywhere else? I want more transparency from my government. Well, you become a more transparent person. Let's see what happens. He walks into the temple and he says, number one, you have prevented Gentiles, non-Jews, people far from God from even knowing God. And number two, you've created this place that's meant to be a place of worship and you've turned it into something other than. And he quotes Jeremiah chapter seven, verse 11. You always have to ask yourself, why does Jesus quote these Old Testament passages? Because they bear incredible weight on our understanding of what the heart and will of God is. Isaiah 56 was about making sure that the foreigners have an opportunity to hear about the love of God. What's Jeremiah 7 say? It says you created an environment where you can hide your sins in the most holiest of places. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, proclaim there the word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all men who, of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is, meaning, don't come to church and think you can hide in your sins and not deal with your sins. That's deceptive. If we're not saying, you know, hey, you can't be a sinner, but what we're saying is if you are a sinner, which we all are, FYI, you're coming into the most sacred of places. Let God deal with the things you're trying to hide. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, the see how the gospel not only has to do with you, it has to do with how you treat others. Shed innocent blood in this place. And if you go, uh, do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, right? In the land I give uh, of old to your fathers forever. Notice how he continues. Behold, you trust in deceptive words, but to no avail. 
you continue to hide and not be the real you. And what do you accomplish? Nothing. Nothing. Will you steal? Will you murder? Will you commit adultery? Will you swear falsely? Will you make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we're delivered. That's false security. Only to go on doing all these abominations. What is the worst argument against Jesus in our culture? Why are there so many hypocrites in this? It's the number one argument against Christianity. And you know what? I sit there and go, I don't know. Great question. Because here's the thing. I've been a hypocrite this week. You've been a hypocrite this week. Some of you have been adulterers this week. Some of you have been murderers this week. Some of you are like, that's harsh language. Jesus says, even if you have anger in your heart, you're a murderous person. Even if you've looked upon another person with lustful thoughts that you've committed adultery with them, right? None of us in this room, let's just be honest, have escaped from being sinners this past week. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now we're starting. Now we're starting with being transparent and vulnerable and honest. Because we're not here to play games with each other. And especially we're not here to try to pull the wool over God's eyes and come hide out in his church, given the appearance that, hey, I'm holy and I'm righteous, when in reality we're not. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you can't come here hurt and you can't come here afflicted and you can't come here addicted and you can't come here troubled and you can't come here messy and dirty and filthy. What I'm going to say to you is this. You can't sit here and think you're safe if you don't allow God to work on all that stuff in your life. Because Jesus says to the guys at the temple, you guys are acting wickedly and you're coming here and this is all protection to continue to cover your wickedness. You're giving the impression that you're religious, but you really aren't. And not only have they committed acts of wickedness outside, they're committing acts of wickedness within by charging exorbitant amounts of money for sacrificial lambs, right? Foreigners would come to the temple and they knew they had to offer up a lamb, but they traveled so far, they, they didn't, We'll just buy one at the temple. Has anyone ever gone to a concert and paid way too much for a beer? I remember going to a U2 concert. Seen them eight, eight times. I'm not bragging, but I went to see it U2. And I remember being like, hey, I'm going to go grab some beers. Who wants some? Wrong question to ask when you're with a group of people and you're the one paying for the bill, right? I think I got five Santan beers and paid $100. And you know what that did to me the rest of the time? Not only am I thinking like, boy, at Fry's, I can get six of these for this amount and I'm running the numbers through my head, right? Now the rest of the concert, I'm only sitting there because I'm grumbling and I'm upset. I can't focus. I can't sing. And I'm going, Bono, I love your sunglasses, but I'm really upset about the beer I overpaid for. <laughs> Has anyone ever been there before? Okay. You come without a lamb, the going rate for lambs, let's just say 10 shekels. You're there and because of the convenience we're not going to charge you a thousand shekels. But I can get, it doesn't matter. You have to worship. And not only that, oh, you're bringing foreign currency in? Now the exchange rate on your currency being trans, you know, exchanged here. Not, these people, the Jews, were not about worship. They were about their egos and their economy. The purity of worship was lost. Jesus walks into an environment, instead of hearing the people say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, they're saying, sacrificial lambs here. Get your sacrificial lambs here. Ready, prepare for the altar. Right, going once, going twice, right? Is there a reason Jesus is upset? You better believe it. These people were not praying for the people. They were praying on the people. 
Number one, you have a people to love in your life. You have people to love. That is your purpose. And your goal is to lead them in purity and worship before a holy God. I would never want to take a Bible that we pass out for free and charge someone who comes in who doesn't have one. I go, oh, this paperback Bible can be yours for 50 bucks. But it says $2.99. I don't care what it says. You're going to pay $50 for this Bible. No, 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 no. Ladies and gentlemen, you absorb whatever it costs it takes for someone to come to know God and worship him. Jesus is exposing the purity. Can I just tell you right now as a church, can we just keep it simple? Let's come together. Let's love on each other. Let's pray. Let's sing. Let's dive into the word. Let's celebrate communion. Let's be baptized. That's it. Don't come to me and go, hey, when's Superman going to make the show? When are you going to come in on like flying like an angel? Cross. You know, when are we going to put some lasers and it's not going to happen? Why? Because people aren't looking for that. People are looking for the authentic people of God to worship in spirit and truth. Be you. Be you. Maybe we need to whisper that, lean over to your neighbor and say, just be yourself. Just be yourself. I've never sat with anybody, and I'm, I'm looking in this room, and a lot of us have had one-on-one -on -one conversations. You've never disclosed anything to me where my response was like this. <gasps> has, anyone, has anyone ever experienced that with me? Okay, just, just checking. Our God does not do that to us. He knows the deepest, darkest recesses of our lives, and he still chooses to love us. Don't walk out into the world and be upset when sinners sin. Because that's what sinners do. Right? <gasps> that person said the F word. Well, guess what? Sometimes you do too. I never do, just so you guys know. I never do. Let's be real as we hang out together. Let's model transparency. Let's model vulnerability. Let's model honesty. Because that's the kind of culture that God wants to create. And that's the kind of culture that invites outsiders in. You know the dirt on one another and you still love one another? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So make it your goal this week, homework. Share your dirt with somebody you've never shared your dirt with before. Do it. Because here's what you're going to find. That's a good friend. I'm glad I have men in my life that can speak into my life and call out things in my life. And I know they're for me, not against me. And that just strengthens any relationship. That's what the church is designed to be. A place, not a, a super Walmart on steroids, but a hospital where people have been hurt and they can find healing with God and with one another. And all God's people said, Amen. we're not done yet. Last point, we'll finish with this. Notice verse 47, it says, all the religious leaders could do at this moment is find to destroy Jesus. You wonder why some people can be so angry and upset. Well, he's striking at the heart of their, their idols. They're false gods, all the things they've trusted in that don't bring, bring joy, don't bring hope, don't bring life. But then it says in verse 47, but they couldn't destroy him because he had attracted this crowd of people who, and I love how Luke says this, they were hanging on his every word. Last point, Jesus is exposing a lack of passion to hear. Here's how I'm bringing this full circle. The only way you will understand your purpose for living is if you listen to the words of Jesus. The only way you can pursue to love people that are so unlike you is when you continue to listen to the voice of Jesus. And the only way you will retain purity in your worship before God is if you continue to listen to the words of Jesus. What did I say there that was the constant denomination of all those points? Hang on the words of Christ. Notice, I didn't, I'm glad Luke didn't say, eh, they just listened to the words of Jesus. Because we can listen and not hear. Can I get an amen from every wife in a marriage right now? With a, yeah, okay. We can listen but not hear. 
We give too much time and attention to voices outside the voice of our Lord. What are some of the comp competing voices we, we listen to today? Open floor. What are some of the voices that speak to us that are not God's voice? All media. All media. What else? Music. Music. What else? The enemy. the enemy. What else? Your boss. Self. Your boss? Your boss. Wow. We don't want to know where you work, Brooke, but okay, we'll, we'll take that, right? Who else do we listen to that we don't need to spend so much time listening to? Family. Someone said that first service too. Like, oh man, that's tough, right? YouTubers, YouTubers right? Listen, you guys, none of, the, <laughs> none of the things, none of the things any one of us have just mentioned are inherently evil, but they become evil the more we give time and attention to them as far as their influence and how they speak into our lives. I'm going to tell you right now, the reason why so many of us have ended up in joyless, hopeless, unsatisfying existences is because we have not hung on the words of Christ. And we have bought into listening to too many other voices, and those voices do not speak life and hope and joy to us. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, are you going to leave? just like everyone else left. And, Jesus, and Peter says to Jesus, where are we to go, Lord, because only you have the words of eternal life. Folks, hang on the words of Christ. You know what that looks like? It looks like this. I can't wait for him to open his mouth again. What's going to come out? What's going to come out? What's going to come out? What's going to say? What's going to say? Because it's going to be good. Nothing comes out of the, the mouth of Christ that's bad. Nothing comes out of the mouth of Christ that is not beneficial. Nothing comes out of the mouth of Christ that is not healthy. Nothing comes out of the mouth of Christ that is not the best for the glory of God and your good. Why aren't we hanging on the words of Christ? Stop listening, heeding voices, and listen to the voice of your God. And all God's people said, let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. You've given us a place to come together. You've given us a place to, to be with one another. You've given us a place to, to, to come before you and a place where we can celebrate all that you are and all that you've done through music and we can celebrate what we have experienced in Christ together and we can laugh and we can share tears and oh Father, how precious it is even to open the word and to, to encounter a Christ like we've seen today who has shown us that meekness is not weakness and that there are times when Jesus has to call out certain things that are ultimately to, to bring you glory and honor, Father. And, and I pray that you would show us in our heart of hearts, in our soul of souls, Lord, what we need to look at and address and with your strength and with your guidance to, to, to make better. We are nothing without you. And we can go nowhere without you. But in you, we have everything we need. Lord, remind us of that. Thank you that you have loved us and accepted us and you have treasured us as, as not only your sons and daughters, but something even beyond that that is so, so hard to fathom right now. But Lord, we've been loved with such tenderness and kindness and grace and we thank you for that. I thank you for this church community. I thank you for what you're doing here. I thank you for the fact that we can call you our God and you can call us your people. Help us to live for you. And as we live for you, help us to point other people to you. Because without that, there's nothing of value. Thank you for loving us in Christ Jesus. And it is his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. Love you. Stay cool out there, okay? Bye-bye.